Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And so we are going to now to start the second session of the workshop. This session uh, will be uh, the last one for this day. And uh, we will have seven presentations dealing with mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And so uh, to refresh, I will try uh, to start with uh, one small slide, uh, just to give back the definitions of what is, uh, what is, what is mitigation and what is adaptation. So if we take the definition of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate and Change, mitigation is gathering all the actions to reduce the sources or enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. And adaptation is the process of adjustment to actual or expected climate and its effects. And so you can see that many aspects of adaptation we already uh, assessed and uh, tried to answer yesterday and today during the session one. And that's the reason why today we have more presentations on the mitigation than on adaptation. In agriculture, these two principles, mitigation and adaptation, are combined in the three components of the climate smart agriculture, and which has been defined by FAO. Gathering the sustainability, so what was called before the good agricultural practices, adaptation, strengthened resilience to climate change and variability, and mitigation, reduce agriculture's contribution to climate, to climate change. In fact, it's out of date now to speak about GAP. From the moment, huh, in a context of climatic change, we will need to speak about CSA, Climate Smart Agriculture, in order to take into account the sustainability, of course, but also all huh, the parameters linked to climate change, assessing the adaptation, assessing the possible mitigation. So I stop here. Uh, we, we have two subsessions this morning. Uh, the first one will be how can rubber systems contribute to climate change mitigation? And we'll have five presentations. The first one will be addressed by Dr. Yann Nouvelon from CIRAD, who is currently working in Bangkok in the HRPP. TVR research platform in partnership. He's a civil researcher and I, I give him the floor. Please, Dr. Yan, try to keep the 15 minutes time. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, then, uh, can you see the screen correctly? Or can you hear me correctly? Yes? Yes. Okay. Then uh, I, I will, uh, my presentation will be on the effect of uh, large scale tree plantation on, uh, um, okay, okay, uh, on, um, on the local climate. And this is a, a presentation uh, that uh, I have done with my uh, colleague from uh, CIRAD, uh, from uh, Kassetsart University. Uh, from uh, Rubber Authority of Thailand and the uh, two University of Brazil. Um, I, I will present results obtained not only on uh, rubber tree plantation, but also on uh, eucalyptus plantation, fast growing eucalyptus plantation, uh, which, are, which have rotation of about six, seven years and uh, produce uh, wood for uh, paper, uh, paper, paper wood and for uh, the production of uh, energy. Uh, for example, charcoal for the steel industry. And uh, of course, I will speak about rubber tree plantation, where we have done, uh, we have much data also, and uh, which produce wood also uh, uh, in uh, addition to uh, natural uh, rubber. Then this plantation can have a global impact on the climate uh, through their effect on atmospheric CO2 uh, concentration uh, because for example if you establish plantation uh, on grassland or crop plants it can increase the carbon stock at the scale of landscape and then uh, it, it 
it, uh, it decreases uh, the concentration of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. But also the wood uh, ca can be used as a substitute, the wood at the end of the rotation can be used as a substitute for uh, fossil carbon. For example, if it is used in the steel industry as charcoal or if it is used in uh, energy facility, then it can avoid uh, further CO2 um, emission. And uh, natural rubber is also, of course, a renewable product. Then, uh, if it is used in spite of uh, synthetic rubber, it can also avoid the emission of the fossil carbon. Um, <coughs> okay. <coughs> But uh, uh, there, there are also um, local effects of uh, plantation. For example, the evaporating cooling can decrease temperature, surface temperature, and uh, this is done mostly from uh, geophysical factors such as uh, reflectance, evaporation, and surface roughness. And uh, this can have an effect on local temperature that is uh, much higher than uh, the effect it could have from uh, carbon sequestration, from the, from the sucking of uh, carbon from the atmosphere. Then, <coughs> I, I have fallen. Okay. Uh, we, we, we know correctly that uh, large scale plantation can affect, uh, can have a strong impact on the water cycle and um, on the energy cycle, on uh, water resources. Uh, for for uh, eucalyptus plantation, for example, they have a very strong uh, productivity. And this productivity is generally associated with a high water use. And uh, this is well known for eucalyptus, but it is also the case in general for, uh, for in, in many cases, for rubber plantation. For example, you can see the title of this uh, article. Uh, and then the question is, is it good or bad to have a high evapotranspiration? Uh, then if you see natural uh, forests, we offer, are often praised uh, for their high evapotranspiration because if you have a high evapotranspiration, then that means that you have uh, efficient recycling of uh, rainfall uh, in the atmosphere and it can have a positive feedback on climate, on the rainfall. It can decrease the temperature and it can also decrease the uh, vapor pressure deficit. It can decrease the fruiting and the loss of nutrients. But if you have a high uh, evapotranspiration, you can also um, uh, decrease the river flow, uh, the, the water table level, and, um, and it can be a problem if uh, there are some conflict for the water and industry. But you, you see that the public opinion, they generally uh, consider uh, high evapotranspiration as positive for natural forests, but negative, they insist on the negative effect for uh, uh, plantation, whether it is eucalyptus plantation and rubber tree plantation. But, but in fact, the process are the same. Huh? And uh, having an high evapotranspiration can be positive also for uh, plantation. Uh, because of the, the negative, because it decreases the temperature of the surface. Um, then here it's a slide that explains a little bit the, the process. Um, there are two, two main parameters that are important to explain the effect of land cover on the surface temperature. The first one is albedo, uh, which determines the, the the energy that is from the sun that is reflected by the surface, and then it determines the net radiation. And the second um, factor is the partitioning of the available energy between evaporation and sensible heat flux. Then uh, here you have the net radiation, and um, if you have an important evapotranspiration, a lot of this energy can be used to vaporize water, because to, for the vaporization of uh, one kilogram of water, you need 2.45 uh, megajoules of, uh, of uh, energy. Then, for example, for an evapotranspiration of one millimeter, you will consume 2.45 megajoules per metre square of uh, energy. 
Then if you have a surface with a low evapotranspiration, uh, pro probably the temperature will increase. But if you have a surface with high evapotranspiration, the temperature of the surface will decrease. Then, for example, if you replace grassland, uh, which have a high albedo but a low evapotranspiration uh, by eucalyptus plantation or rubber tree plantation, uh, which have um, albedo that is lower but uh, much higher evapotranspiration due to deep rooting, uh, surface roughness and ice conditions, then you, you will decrease you will decrease the temperature due to the surface cooling. Uh, under, under the tropics, uh, it's, uh, most of the study found that uh, the effect of uh, high evapotranspiration dominates the effect of lower albedos and we, uh, we, we have uh, almost always a decrease of temperature when we replace cropland or grassland by plantation. Then, for example, this can be seen from satellite. Huh? Uh, this is a comparison the, in this paper uh, of Peng et al. Uh, a comparison of the surface temperature, uh, land surface temperature, yeah, uh, of uh, planted forest and natural forest. The natural forest and planted forest they have similar characteristics. Then the temperature is approximately the, the same in, in most cases. Uh, now, if you have um, a, a planted forest, a comparison of planted forest on grassland in green or planted forest on the cropland in uh, orange, you can see that the planted forest have lower temperature during the day and slightly higher temperature uh, during uh, the night. But the net effect is a decrease of temperature. And this was in China for different type of uh, planted forest. But here you have the, the effect um, on Argent, in Argentina and Uruguay. This is a study by Jack, uh, Jackson et al. And for grassland and the uh, eucalyptus and pinus. And you, you see that even if the um, uh, eucalyptus and the pinus have lower albedo than grassland, because they have much higher evapotranspiration, the surface temperature is much lower. Than the grassland, there are several degrees of difference. Um, we, we can also study the, uh, the um, energy cycle and evapotranspiration uh, uh, thanks to flux tower. Then we have uh, more than ten uh, years of measurement in uh, Brazil on eucalyptus plantation and also in Thailand on uh, rubber tree plantation and. Uh, I will just show some uh, of the results. Huh? For example, here it's in eucalyptus plantation in uh, Brazil. In blue, uh, you have the mean monthly, uh, uh, mean daily, okay, this is uh, mean daily evaporation for each month in, uh, in blue. And uh, in yellow, you have the available energy. And uh, here it's the uh, first rotation, the end of the first rotation. Here, here you have a clear cut, and then this is the next rotation. And you can see that um, most of the energy, available energy, uh, was used for evapotranspiration. And uh, there were little uh, energy uh, that was uh, lost at sensible heat flux. Sensible heat flux, it is uh, energy you can feel. Then, uh, it just shows that in this case, in this uh, type of uh, eucalyptus plantation in Brazil, in the state of Sao Paulo, uh, most of the energy is used uh, for evapotranspiration. Then you, you probably have uh, uh, important surface cooling, and uh, we check this with a satellite image. Then here you have a Google image that shows a plantation in uh, a black green. and. Uh, Around the plantation, you have different type of crops, uh, sugarcane, and uh, even here you have citrus plantation. And uh, you can see that the, with a thermal image from uh, Landsat, the temperature in uh, the plant eucalyptus plantation was much lower than around for other crops around the plantation. Uh, blue is uh, cold and red is hot. And uh, we did this comparison for many other uh, covers. 
uh, here in blue you have the lake, then uh, it's a uh, color, uh, cooler temperature. It's for the, uh, here you have the city in black, and here you have different type of crops, uh, for example, soybean, uh, sugarcane. And uh, here you have natural forest and uh, eucalyptus plantation and pinus plantation in green. And uh, you can see that the lowest temperature were for pinus and eucalyptus and then natural forest. A natural forest is, is not rainforest, and it's a cerrado. Then it's, um, uh, okay. Then it just shows uh, the, the huge effect. You, you see you can have uh, several degrees uh, between uh, these different cover and this is uh, mostly due uh, to the high evapotranspiration. And this is uh, another, um, uh, it's in, in the same eucalyptus plantation in uh, Brazil. Uh, here you have the evapotranspiration and the different color is the uh, depth uh, where the water was uptake. And you, you can see that uh, uh, the, the plantation can uptake water very deep. Okay. Uh, and uh, because uh, the root system develops very deep, uh, the, very fast. Uh, for example, at two years, you have roots uh, already at 10. 12 uh, meters and uh, rapidly it reaches the water table and uh, it can um, uh, then it, it explain why you have uh, an evapotranspiration that is so high hein, because you, the, the tree has the ability to Jan, use, uh, yes you, you have two minutes two minutes okay left. okay very deep but for uh, for a rubber plantation it's uh, it's the same hein, you have very deep uh, rooting uh, this is, for example, rubber plantation in Thailand, eh? and you can see in the south of Thailand, you can see uh, the, the roots very deep also, because like eucalyptus. And uh, this is evapotranspiration in, uh, um, that was measured in our site in Cha Chuen Sao in uh, Thailand. And uh, here it's uh, rub uh, evapotranspiration measured by Gambia Luca uh, and uh, colleague in uh, Cambodia. And uh, in the northern Thailand, and you can see that the evapotranspiration also is very high because you have deep soil and uh, it's fertilized plantation. Um, and most of the energy was also used in all these sites. Uh, most of the energy, uh, 73% and 70% of the energy was used for evapotranspiration. Then you probably, uh, we didn't measure the surface temperature, but you probably have also uh, temperatures that are much lower than um, the, the other type of uh, crops. Uh, then I have some conclusion on perspective. Uh, I discuss a lot about the surface temperature, but we don't know, um, we, we do not have as much information about the, the, the effect of, uh, of, the evapor of the plantation on other variables such as the rainfall, uh, we, we don't know. Then for this, we will uh, need more uh, study. Uh, but for the effect of temperature, it's well established. Huh? Uh, if, if we compare with natural forest, we have similar temperature. But if we compare uh, plantation with grassland or crop plants, we have a strong cooling effect, a lower temperature. And also something I didn't discuss yet is the effect of management. Uh, in uh, Brazil, for example, we saw that if you fertilize, you, you can increase a lot uh, the productivity, especially the fertilization for uh, with potassium. Uh, you increase a lot the productivity, but you increase also uh, the evapotranspiration. Then uh, you probably also uh, decrease the uh, temperature. Uh, and for the next research, uh, re, uh, next research, I think it would be important to uh, to have a um, um, model. Uh, ecophysiological process models that are coupled with uh, uh, regional atmospheric model in order to be able to, to better uh, study the effect of plantation on uh, rainfall uh, because normally uh, we have a positive effect on rainfall but it's not systematic and also on other variables such as relative humidity and, uh, and uh, vapor pressure density. Okay, then um, uh, sorry if I was a little too long. Okay. 
Thank you. Speak. Thank you, Jan. Your time is elapsed. Okay. I have finished. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the, these very interesting presentations. Uh, for any participants, uh, if you have questions to ask to Jan and to the other participants, you can uh, put your question, write your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box. So we are now uh, we are now going to the second the second uh, presenter for this subsession. So the second present presenter is Dr. Jesse uh, from a uh, Rebel Research Institute of India. Uh, who is also the liaison officer uh, for IRDB, the agronomy group. So please, Dr. Jesse, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon. The topic of presentation is improving biodiversity in rubber plantations, a low-cost strategy to mitigate drought and sustain soil health. The contents of the presentation will be a climate change impact on natural rubber sector, then how biodiversity can be improved in rubber plantations, and effect of biodiversity on mitigation of drought, and sustaining soil fertility, and finally, there will be a conclusion. And climate change impact is a, actually a climate uncertainty, which is affecting the scheduling of farm operations like planting, fertilizer application, etc. And we also experienced extreme weather events. And, uh, in 2018, we had the worst flood in Kerala, which is the uh, major area under rubber cultivation in India. And last year also, we experienced a severe flood in certain pockets. And there is rising temperature during the dry season, frequent dry spells, that is due during the middle of the monsoon season. And in fact, drought is increasing and some of the diseases are increasing and more and more new and new diseases are coming up in the picture. Finally, this will all influence the livelihood security of the rubber growers. And the possibilities of improving biodiversity in rubber plantations are many. It's actually rubber is grown in warm, warm fluid tropics and subtropics where a lot of rainfall is available. So there will be luxuriant vegetation in association with rubber. It can be intercrops, annual and short term crops, perennial crops like coffee, cocoa, etc., vanilla, and several crops are there. Then there can be medicinal and ornamental plants along with rubber, power crops, and natural vegetation. And these are some of the popular intercrops in rubber plantations of India. Banana, pineapple. Then we can have a combination of crops also in a three tier system. That is, rubber as the first tier, then second tier banana, and third tier vegetables. So, this is a more effective utilization of the available land and light in the plantation system so as to improve the land productivity. And we can also have leguminous cover crops, which are nitrogen fixing in rubber plantations, as uh, entire uh, for modern weeds and other beneficial effects. These are uh, perennial intercrops. The popular ones are cocoa, coffee, etc. Single row in between two rubber, plant, rubber rows. And we can also have, can have medicinal plants along with rubber. These are the, each country will be having different medicinal plants. These are uh, shade taller medicinal plants which will grow under mature rubber in rubber plantations of India. So these are ornamental plants which are also uh, shade tolerant and can be cultivated in mature rubber plantation under shade. And if you are not going for any intercrop or uh, natural, this, uh, there will be a luxuriant growth of natural flora in rubber plantations, which as we can see here, the weeding was done along the platforms to facilitate tapping and the inter row area was left unweeded. So we can see a lot of vegetation in the inter row area. And this is somewhat a managed system where the uh, weeds are allowed to grow under management. And this is also Mikuna cover crop under mature rubber plantation. That is usually in mature rubber plantations, the vegetation will be less. 
it will be just like a monoculture plantation without very very less undergrowth but if you are managing this vegetation we can have a very good blanket of uh, undergrowth in our plantation and to coming to the mitigation of drought possibilities are irrigation but water is a scarce resource and also there is a cost involved in providing irrigation and there is a possibility for in situ rainwater harvesting and conservation of soil moisture and we can also improve the soil physical chemical properties these two are in fact uh, uh, related by improving soil physical chemical properties you can improve the soil water infiltration and water holding capacity and finally conservation of soil moisture and we can say that uh, as uh, we all know rubber sheds live during the wintering season and sunlight falls directly on the soil surface and increasing the soil temperature and evapotranspiration and if there's an undergrowth there is an improvement in soil moisture status during the summer season so we are getting additional income and also an, a mitigation of drought in our plantations so we established uh, calapogonium ceruleum in the later maturity phase that is after the uh, removal of the food crops third year and it uh, grows under partial shade also and we can see that here also we are improving the soil moisture status by maintaining this cover crop so we have to uh, plan for different phases of our plantation cycle and this is the mature rubber plantation where the possibility of including food crops is limited so here also we can see that if we are maintaining uh, this natura flora or ikuna there is an improvement in soil moisture status and we can also see additional advantage that it reduces the velocity of runoff water and also increase the infiltration rate and finally increases the water holding capacity of the soil and water conservation so these are all low cost options to improve the soil moisture conservation and mitigation of drought in our plantations and again as we have shown in the earlier slide when we are maintaining natural flora also there is an improvement in soil moisture status during the dry season so a lot of data we have to prove that the undergrowth is conserving soil moisture and reducing the intensity of drought in the plantations so finally coming to the conclusion from these slides this retaining any vegetation that can be either crops natural flora or leguminous cover crops we reduce the runoff of rain water, rain water increase infiltration of water and conserve soil moisture and finally it reduces the intensity of the drought in the plantation and coming to the next aspect sustaining fertility of upper ground soils for sustaining fertility we have to first identify the soil fertility constraints and then manage the constraint for identifying the soil fertility constraints we conducted an extensive soil survey in the rubber grower regions of india and we found that we collected 11000 soil samples on a 50 hectare bed basis and we can see the intensity of soil sampling and with this we generated soil fertility maps of all fertility parameters parameters and we can see the fertility map which shows the site specific fertility constraint this shows the this red area shows the area which are low in available sink status so we can have a site specific approach in nutrient management and the major major soil fertility constraint we identified is soil acidity then declining cation content in the soil the low status of micronutrients like zinc and boron these are the fertility constraints in rubber grown soils of india and we can see this yellow the uh, soil acidity is a serious constraint majority of the soils have ph of Uh, less than five. Okay, we can see in South India, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu, this yellow patch is uh, uh, very strongly acidic, and red patch is extremely acidic. Like that in Northeast India, Tripura, which are the, these two are the major rubber rubber growing regions in India, the acidity is uh, even higher. More, almost ninety nine percent of the area is either extremely acidic or very strongly acidic. And we all know from the literature that. Soil pH below five increases soil aluminium toxicity. They also reduce the nutrient uptake of several uh, several ions, then decrease root growth and drought, drought tolerance. And when we compare the forest with the rubber, there is a decline in soil pH. And we know the reasons for this decline in soil pH. 
And in fact, cations are also decreasing in our planets. When we think of soil quality, I think you have to be specific. Which factor we are attempting, say the pH or cations, because all have different management practices. So rather than the, we, uh, it's a blanket soil fertility aspect like soil quality aspect like that, go for specifics. Here we can see both the calcium and magnesium status is low compared to forest near rubber plantation. And coming to the amelioration of soil acidity, which is the major constraint, liming is the traditional practice. But it increased the cost of cultivation. In fact, lime itself is costly and there is a lot of labor involved for lime application. And, but we can go for in-situ management of vegetation to exploit the natural processes. And we can also go for need-based fertilizer application because we know that excess fertilizer application increases soil acidity. Here, uh, this slide shows the effect of continuous application of fertilizers on soil pH. In fact, uh, after the years, soil pH is decreasing. But this is not always the case. We cannot generalize this slide because when fertilizers are applied in excess of the requirement only, this there is acidification. And also it is related to the ground cover management also because we know that nitrogen fixing legumes will increase soil acidity. And in fact, the effect of vegetation is different on soil pH. Different vegetation will have different effect on soil acidity. We can see natural cover increasing soil pH or reducing soil acidity. Pure area doesn't have much influence on the soil acidity even though it is nitrogen fixing. But at the same time, mucuna is decreasing substantially soil pH. And vegetation infers soil calcium status also in a different manner. Here we can see that natural cover is increasing soil calcium status. Status of base cations are also increasing when we are uh, maintaining natural flora in a mature rubber plantation also. We can see available potassium, calcium, magnesium, all base cations are increasing because there will be a stratified root system which will prevent the leaching of uh, these cations. And in fact, there will be a science behind this increase of soil pH by the natural flora. And in fact, it is dependent upon the organic anion content of the litter and also the excess cation present in the litter. That's why each vegetation will have different effect on soil pH. Here we can see that the alkalinity of the litter is more for natural flora. So there is a direct relation between these two. So nat natural flora when retained will is improving the soil pH or decreasing soil acidity. So it's a very good uh, low cost option. And uh, we conducted incubation studies also to, uh, to find out the further science. And we can see here also diverse litter is influencing the soil in a different manner. Here, as an example, we have shown the slide for magnesium. We can see that the particular certain types, the effect is different. These were not applied with any fertilizers, these crop litter. When we are applying fertilizer also, these crops also differ in their influence on the soil, soil nutrient status. Uh, here also magnesium is given, but this influence will be again influenced by the fertilizer application for the particular crop. We cannot generalize here. And when we are retaining natural flora also, the, the stock of organic carbon, potassium, calcium, magnesium, all are improving. Soil respiration, which is an indication of the soil health, is also improving when we are maintaining the undergrowth of weeds. Here, this plantation, we are maintaining an undergrowth of mucuna, and here also the soil, soil organic carbon status is improved compared to the plantation where we are not retained the vegetation. So we found that judicious crop mixing is improving soil health. We can see when we are diverse intercrops are grown. Earlier we showed the effect of natural flora, then different intercrops. Here we also we can see that this soil microbial population is more when there is a crop mixing. Like that, soil available sink status, which is a constraint in many rubber growing regions of India, is also improving under mixer cropping. That is not the effect of crop alone. It is due to the fertilizer applied to the associated crop also. Unlike that for natural flora. Jesse, you have two minutes, two minutes left. 
So it is improving the soil microbial population and earthworm castings also. So finally, we can see that the judicious crop mixing is uh, and exploiting the natural process will improve the soil health. And for need-based fertilizer replication, or fertilizer application, we want an online fertilizer recommendation system for our plantations in India. And we developed a mobile app for also, so that each grower can get the fertilizer recommendation of his field from the plantation within uh, two, three minutes, all based on real-time data. And it uh, ensures need-based fertilizer application. It prevents soil degradation, De reduce cost of cultivation and enhance growth and yield of rubber. So coming to my conclusions, with price volatility, increasing cost of cultivation and climate change are serious challenges being faced by the plantation sector and local sustainable strategies are to be evolved for addressing the changes to reduce the cost of cultivation which is shooting up in many countries. Exploiting natural processes for ecosystem sustainability is of critical importance. Improving biodiversity in rubber plantations will conserve soil moisture and mitigate drought, decrease soil acidity, improve soil fertility, and increase soil microbial population. So we have generated a lot of data in India. I think other rubber growing countries also will be having a lot of data this way. Then we have to consolidate this type of data and we need appropriate policy frameworks for the sustainable development of the sector for reducing the cost of cultivation and improving the soil fertility status of the rubber holdings. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jesse, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I will have maybe some questions at the, at the end during the Q&A. Uh, we are now moving to the third presentation of the subsession. Uh, I will uh, introduce Dr. Fatima uh, from a Malaysian rubber board, uh, who is going to have a talk about uh, possible substitution to synthetic rubber by natural rubber. So Dr. Fatima, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. All right, so um, hello everyone. Um, so my today's presentation will be on the products from specialty natural rubber as an alternative material to the uh, synthetic rubber towards application uh, of naturally sustainable resource. So before I proceed further, I, just, uh, I would like to give you some overviews of the Malaysian rubber industry. If you actually divide the sector into the three main um, main activities so we can see on the downstream activities most of the kega is actually uh, showing a positive trend uh, this is actually uh, related to the export of the rubber products rubber consumption employment and also the export contribution to rubber industry this is also reflected to the world market value of the rubber products where malaysia is actually at the eighth position and contributing about 3%, and most of it is from the rubber glove, which reflected to 75%. So, if we see the context of the Malaysian rubber industry from this three mainstream, we can see that the upstream sector can be considered as environmental sustainable due to the source itself, because it's a renewable source, and the rubber tree is also a source of the carbon sequestration. And in Malaysia, there's no issue on the deforestation. And this is uh, also being supported by the midstream sector and the rubber downstream uh, sector of the rubber industry, where most of this sector is actually complying into the Environmental Quality Act in Malaysia. As you can see in the midstream sector, uh, it is assured that all the effluent treatments that be discharged from this sector is within the legal limits without any adverse effects to the environment. And for the downstream sector, which are focusing on the product manufacturing, the factory is actually equipped with the modern technology to actually uh, uh, comply to the regulation related to the environment. However, if you see on the technical aspect of the rubber itself, uh, we know there's a certain drawbacks in terms of this te technical uh, factor where some of the product application 
um, is, re is actually restricted to be used. So uh, for one of the example is on the oil resistant. So with that, uh, we in MRB uh, try to overcome this disadvantages in the natural rubber by further modifying by further doing modification on the structure and also on the material. Okay, so for today's presentation, I would like to actually um, bring to you on the modification of the natural rubber, which is known as the deprotonized natural rubber and also the epoxy dash natural rubber. Uh, the trademark in Malaysia is known as Priopina and Ecropina. And these uh, two material is actually conducted and produced via the physical and also chemical modification route. For the Priopina or the deprotonized natural rubber, uh, it actually involves the enzymatic uh, attack on the protein content of the natural rubber. So by removing this protein content, it gives better interaction of the rubber particle itself with the compounding ingredient during the rubber product manufacturing. And as for the epoxidation reaction, uh, it actually involves an uh, in situ reaction of the formic acid and hydrogen peroxide, which perform, uh, which actually form the performing acid. And later on, this performing acid will react with the double bond in the structure of natural rubber to form the COC cyclic uh, epoxy ring. So with this changing in the structure, it actually helps to improve further and enhance the uh, properties of natural rubber for to actually uh, diverse the application in products. So in terms of the product uh, production of these two material, most of the process is actually similar to what the TSR is actually having. Uh, only uh, The difference only can be seen on the initial part of the process where both of these uh, material require a reactors and also a steam coagulator. Uh, however, if you require the latex straight from from this ecopina and priopina, you can just uh, actually take it from the after the reaction uh, process and then further uh, concentrate it to get uh, at higher DRC content, or you can immediately use it uh, for other types of product application. So, as I mentioned, from this priopina and ecopina, you can actually get a rubber block, you can get the latex version of the material, and Further on, if you reacted further on the ENR or Ecopina latex, you can actually form a new material called liquid epoxidized natural rubber. Why the variation on this uh, material is uh, with the aim to actually increase and widen the application in rubber products. Okay, uh, here I would like to actually address on the ENR. Um, uh, properties in terms of its latex. Why? Because uh, in uh, as mentioned previously, you can see that ENR actually having a structure change. So we wanted to actually know is there any difference to the normal natural rubber um, that we are actually using currently. So if you can see here, um, via the concentration process of this ENR, it can actually increase further the um, DRC content. However, for ENR, the only possible route to actually increase this, this DRC is through the membrane process. Uh, and if you see on the morphology um, uh, image down here, you can see that the LETZ latex compared to the ENR after concentration, the uh, particle is much more tacky compared to the ENR latex before concentration. This is due to the effect of the surfactant that being added inside the reaction of this ENR to actually withstand the heat during the reaction. So via the concentration process, it actually reduces the, um, the effect of the surfactant onto the rubber particle that being able this material to further used in uh, product application. As for the uh, liquid epoxidized natural rubber or uh, the LENR, um, it is quite different from the block rubber as because this material can flow um, and the appearance is quite soft and sticky. Other than that, it also having the number of molecular weight lower compared to the normal natural rubber at about 10,000 gram per mole. Okay, uh, if you see just now, I'm I'm touching on the technical aspect of how we actually changing the natural rubber so that it can actually um, 
fit into various uh, product application. So uh, we also need to also uh, look into the sustainability aspect of the production of the material. So uh, with that, we use the LCA uh, to actually assess the environmental impact on the uh, production of this specialty rubber material. For this, we only use uh, we we are only presented to you on the Eco Prina Twenty Five production, which we uh, currently uh, previously done it in Malaysian Rubber Board Pilot Plant um, Factory, and the result here is actually uh, showing you only the gate to gate boundary. So from the analysis of the eleven weighting impact categories, we can see that <clears throat> there are environmental hotspot on the fossil fuel which representing about 65.2%. However, this can actually be reduced if the current diesel boiler that being used is changed to other greener type of boiler, such as the biomass. So by, by changing that, it actually giving better impact on the environment uh, regarding the process of this material. Okay, so once we have this material, we need to also understand whether is there a good impact in terms of application to the various products in rubber. So if we can categorize the products in uh, rubber products, uh, we can categorize it as tire products, non-tire products, and also latex products. So the products that I'm going to actually present it to you today is actually a commercial um, produced product using the facilities by the, uh, through collaboration with manufacturers in Malaysia. And then it is given to the end users to actually try it out. And data are collected from that so that we know that the material that being produced can be an alternative material to substitute uh, the current material that being used. Okay, first of all, we can see on the tire products. The specialty rubber can actually cater in terms of four types of tire, which is the uh, commercial tire, passenger car tire, motorcycle tire, and also the solid tire. So if you see the results on uh, most of it, on the general aspect of this tire product, we see that by using this specialty rubber, it gives more distance, it improves the fuel efficiency, and also it gives excellent grip. So if you focus on the uh, passenger car tire results on the left bottom, you will see that the rolling resistance uh, of the car uh, of the tire produced from this specialty rubber having less rolling resistance about nine percent. This reflecting to a, a, a fuel consumption being less than one to two, uh, one to three percent. So by less fuel consumption use, there will be less emission of carbon uh, dioxide to the environment. So on the wet grip and also dry grip you can see that it gives you better grip in terms of the uh, usage in the wet um, area or also and also in the dry uh, road and on the right side on the uh, on the right side of the slide you can see that that, that is uh, the result for the retread style so if you uh, actually looking into getting alternative uh, material for retreats. We are also having a positive results where it gives you more distance and uh, similar results are also uh, um, uh, uh, can be seen for the retreat where the fuel also is being saved. Okay, next we can move uh, our product application to the non-tire products where here I would like to address on the footwear where uh, we actually um, diverse its application to anti-static shoe, marching boots, and also safety shoe. So uh, most uh, of all this footwear, we can see that it gives you good damping property, it improves the skid resistance, it gives you bad, good or resistant, and also good abrasion resistance. By adding uh, uh, anti-static material in the compound, it also gives you excellent and highly consistent anti-static property of the safety shoe that being produced. On the anti-static um, matters, it actually meeting the international market requirement following the standard in ISO. Next, uh, we can see that this material also can be used for green rubber sound insulator, where the sound insulator is actually acting as a sound wave barrier. Because of the tackiness of the material, it can be easily applied on the wall and also on the roof. So it gives you better uh, sound absorption uh, with the uh, noise from outside. 
from the test, if you see, uh, it is less odor and it also having a good fire resistance according to the standard that being used. And uh, if we focus into the sports activity, we see that this material also can be used in producing a product uh, in, in Malaysian rubber board, we call it as RimSurf, where it's actually a, <clears throat> a spot flooring mat that adapts to a practicality and sustainability approach. So it is ideal for many sports surfaces and we already actually use it commercially in on all those areas. And this material uh, actually giving you physical comfort and better friction and less injury. Okay, now we move on the latex-based product where we can also apply the specialty rubber to be a material in pain. So, uh, in pain category, we are looking into the interior and also the exterior pain in the building. We have already applied this uh, pain actually in our National Elephant Conservation Center in Malaysia and also in some of the housing area and also the buildings uh, all over Malaysia. So the advantages of this Ecoprina latex pain is it is very low in order, non-toxic and also having very low heavy metal content. Um, and this, uh, interestingly, this pain is actually a water-based pain. So there's no solvent or thinner that going to be utilized during the usage of this pain. Then we move to the artwork pain where this pain is actually uh, for school children and also artists that can actually use this as a new, new medium for painting. So if you, if you wanted to actually place this stream color, it's actually between the acrylic and water uh, as the features is actually between uh, two of this uh, commercial grade of um, uh, artwork paint. So it is also um, uh, not a petroleum base as we are using the specialty grade, uh, specialty latex material. And mostly the composition in this uh, artwork paint is actually from natural occurring materials such as the natural rubber, cellulose and also pigment. Okay, so uh, next is the application of the latex of the specialty rubber can be used in making foams where we see that it can be used in shoe midsole, anti-vibration girth and also acoustic foam panel. The advantages... Dr. Fatima, you have yes? two minutes left. Okay. Two minutes. All right. By using this natural rubber, you have actually, uh, you can actually um, uh, making the density of the foam differently so it can absorb different frequency of the uh, noise. Next, we are also applying this material in adhesive for wallpaper and multicolor adhesive. So the, this two um, material also having low VOCs and low heavy metal and less odor. And uh, through the uh, results, we see that the wallpaper adhesive can be actually applied to many uh, types of wallpaper and it also having the uh, addition strength comparable to the uh, normal uh, adhesive that is out there. And lastly, on the latex dip, we see that the tensile properties of this ENR is comparable to whatever natural rubber and natural is actually used. And the permeability test is also is in between the NR and natural. And all resistance is actually better compared to natural rubber. So with all this uh, improvement doing uh, that being done to the natural rubber, it is hoped that the applic application of the material can be really expand in product application so we can give better and greener sustainable uh, world to in future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fatima, for this very interesting uh, presentation on the new products obtained from uh, natural rubber. So I, I will now introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, which will be uh, Professor Sergei Blagodetsky, who has a, a huge experience in, uh, of the rubber cultivation in the south of China, in Sichuan on the the Surimer project. So please, uh, Professor Sergei, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving me possibility to make this presentation. Now I will share my screen.
Yeah. The title of my presentation is Modeling the Impact of Rubber Expansion on Carbon Stocks in the Mountainous Landscape of Southwest China. As already mentioned, uh, the work was done in, with help of a big team of scientists from Germany and China, uh, our University of Hohenheim and uh, World Agroforestry Center in Kunming, China. It was done in the framework of the Suruma project, Sustainable Rubber Cultivation in the Mekong region, which is already finished. And we just finalizing the publications. And my talk today will be about the mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation uh, of uh, climate change impact with the help of rubber plantations. Uh, there are two main issues where the uh, plantation can help in carbon dioxide emission decreasing. This is a carbon sequestration in plant biomass and carbon sequestration in soil. As you can see, we try to measure in our experiment measuring the plant biomass and soil. And adaptation is was in this presentation at least. We investigated erosion and land management change. Uh, under rubber plantation and how the measures could minimize uh, the effect of rubber expansion in tropical region. Uh, and finally, and the maybe most important in this presentation, we tried to look at the problem, problem in integrative way. So we used integrated land use change impact assessment with the help of modeling. And in this view, the difference of my presentation from others, that we try to upscale the problem, evaluate the rubber impact, not just in the field uh, range, but also on the landscape level, and uh, try to project this in future. And for that purposes, of course, very valuable is usage of modeling, which I will show today. Coming to the general uh, possibility to use rubber as a carbon sequestration crop, you can see in this table from the literature, the most ecosystem carbon stock is in a forest. Then we can see large forests and other forest plantation. And the next one is a rubber plantation. It means that we could accumulate very huge amount of carbon in rubber plantation, especially if we switch from cropland with low carbon stocks to rubber. And that's clear and uh, it's already was reviewed and we tried to investigate uh, this possibility in our case study in local case as I will show you next slides. How soil carbon dynamics driving bundle use change uh, looks like if we consider the rubber plantations. Of course, if we have deforestation and tropical forest is substituted by arable land, we have huge loss of carbon normally with the rate of a half to two tons per hectare per year. However, if we will change from uh, arable land to rubber plantation, we can gain carbon stocks in soil. Uh, that you could see uh, the review, for example, in this publication by Poston, how carbon stocks could be restored. But of course, we need to consider that, that this process is much slower than carbon losses due to deforestation. In order to compare the carbon stock under different land use types, we applied so-called time averaged carbon stock approach. This picture in illustrate why we need to use this approach. Because if we consider a rubber plantation in some moment of time in the early stage or late stage, we will get different uh, amount of carbon because of different uh, 
components of carbon budgets will contribute to the carbon stock in this case. And uh, this picture also shows how the accumulation of carbon stocks happens during the rotation, in this case 25 years, but if we consider a longer rotation, 30 to 40 years, even more carbon will be accumulated. And we compare the time average carbon stocks uh, here with this magenta line. And one more point which I would like to stress at this picture, that of course the latex production should be considered because despite of uh, relatively small amount taken up from one tapping, uh, the accumulated values contributes largely in the total carbon stocks in rubber plantation if we consider. And of course, if we have a end of rotation, we should consider incorporation of carbon in the wood, in the furniture in future and so on. And uh, these uh, details on that um, estimates you could see in our publication in 2015 in the review paper. So coming to uh, my today's uh, presentation, I would like to show you two examples of our work where we pose two research questions. How is ecosystem carbon stock vary in specific landscapes experiencing rubber expansion under changing climate? And the second part of the presentation will be about how does environmental protection measures or governmental policy impact the carbon sequestration in a region of under consideration. Uh, our case study was located in China, in South or West China, in uh, Shishan Banat Prefecture in Yunnan. And here we took a small spot where was national uh, reserve, Naban River Watershed National Reserve in the Mekong uh, surcharge Naban here. Uh, that is how it looks like this valley. And this is an area of our research study and uh, condition, climatic conditions. This is a subtropical conditions with this high um, uh, elevation and uh, not very high average temperature. This is a uh, how to say marginal conditions for rubber growth in China. We uh, did our simulations and carbon stock estimation in two dimensions. First, of course, we consider the temporal scale, and the second, we consider special scale at tree, plot, land use, and landscape level. In temporal scale, we analyze how rubber intensification have impact uh, the carbon stocks in soil and in ecosystem. For that, we did field sampling, uh, trying to uh, get information about all land uses in this region. Then we uh, estimated land use change hotspots using our uh, modeling and uh, mapping strategies. And finally, we evaluated carbon emission and sequestration in this region during this time. Based on this analysis, we evaluated how forest protection affect carbon stocks and how rubber intensification impact the time average carbon stocks uh, using the methodology I just showed you before. This is a result, and uh, I just explained shortly what uh, the color on the maps means. So the forest laws are red here, and reforestation is green here. And you see in buffer zone of this natural reserve, it was rather intensive uh, reforestation. And therefore, uh, based on this map, we could estimate carbon emission zones lost carbon loss, a brown in this picture, and carbon gains, green in this picture. And 
maybe not typically for that region, but typical for national reserve, the general output from our analysis what was that carbon not lost in this region. And that was uh, because a carbon uh, sequester under rubber plantation. And if we have changed from arable land to rubber, it's not too bad. And the second, we had a reforestation in this region. And we also try to evaluate using our modeling approach how latex production, tree growth, and carbon uh, accumulation in ecosystems will be affected by future climate change. Uh, details on this work we could find in the journal Forest Ecology and Management in paper by Jan et al. Uh, the calculation in future we did using the modeling approach. In our institute, we mainly using a uh, Lucia model, Land Use Change Impact Assessment. And this is abbreviation for that. Uh, it is integrated framework for trade of assessment. So uh, this model include uh, both biophysical modules presenting soil and soil organic matter dynamics, watershed hydrology, crop tree growth, but also uh, impact from the uh, farmers or decision makers, how this choice of the crops will affect uh, plant growth, carbon accumulation and other processes. I have no time to explain all details of the model. I just will show you shortly uh, the general overview and specific modules which are linked with rubber growth. So this is a general overview showing that we use climatic data from IPCC report, statistical uh, downscaling of that. I will show one slide on that. And also future climate scenarios and generate a daily climate data based from this input data. We also use other information from management, soil properties and hydrological conditions. And these all drivers uh, help us to simulate uh, rubber growth on tree level and upscale it to landscape level. We are simulating in rather detailed photosynthesis, dry matter increase, uh, distribution between plant organs, growth respiration and maintenance respiration. Uh, details of this uh, Lucia model you can find in literature. What was done specifically to simulate rubber, we um, produced so-called plantation mode, where we simulated separate trees growth uh, with specific parameters depending on leaf area index, uh, chrome uh, radius, and Sergei, chrome you have only two minutes left, Sergei. Okay, I will try to uh, speed up. Uh, this is a module presenting the how we simulate the latex and I, I, I just say that it is rather detailed and uh, we can simulate latex flow and latex tapping. And uh, it is uh, simulated depending on the uh, rubber tree size. And in our modeling, we uh, simulated how future change in temperature and precipitation affect the carbon sequestration considering three uh, modeling scenarios depending on climate change scenario from IPCC. These scenarios we took from uh, literature from Zoma et al, where you see that the temperature increased differently at, under these uh, scenarios and also it de increased differently in different locations of our uh, study spot. This is the main conclusion of this work and you see that in Highland, the total biomass increasing more because of cooler condition beforehand and uh, warming helps uh, rubber to grow better. But for latex production, we cannot judge that latex production will be increased due to uh, increasing temperature. Uh, the um, um, weather condition concerning the rainfall, it's not changing too much. 
And this uh, conclusion is similar to what we heard already during this conference. So uh, you can see uh, the details in our recent publication from last year. Uh, the second part was uh, mitigation options, how the planting of uh, on no weeding approach can help in rubber plantations. Uh, because of uh, lack of time, I just very quickly scroll through my slides. And this is a rubber monoculture, how soil degradation can be caused by this uh, cleaning of the trees. And uh, first what we search uh, that uh, the erosion and soil loss is different under different plantation age. And astonishingly, the highest uh, losses was 10 years plantation, not in young plantation. And that was because of herbicides use. And uh, uh, later, protective understory effect and dense capity, uh, canopy de decreased these losses. And we uh, look at that more attentively using also the model. Uh, this is a plot scale modeling and shows that V3 plots uh, has the highest uh, cumulative runoff and uh, also soil losses. And weeding, uh, if we avoid weeding, we decrease the uh, soil losses and erosion. And that was done on a plot level. And later on, we also did it on a landscape level using a land cover map. In this case, rubber plantation has 11% in this region, and red is forest. And we measured uh, the turbidity and water level in the outlet of this watershed, uh, calibrated and verified our model. It was rather successful, as you can see, simulated peak flow uh, against absorbed peak flow and soil loss as well. And finally, we calculated erosion and deposition at watershed using different scenarios of herbicide application. And you see, if we have uh, no herbicide application, we have much less uh, erosion at the watershed level. And we calculated these differences, and it was rather high differences in percent if we have no herbicides or minimize herbicides, herbicide application once per year. This is a sediment expert per watershed. Now I'm finalizing my presentation. Thank you for your attention and I would like to acknowledge of course my collaborators. This work was done mainly by PhD students shown here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sergei, for this uh, presentation, uh, whose uh, conclusions is uh, matching a lot with the previous presentations of Dr. Jesse. Uh, I will now invite the last presenter uh, for this uh, first uh, sub-session. So, Professor Minami Matsui uh, from uh, Raiken, Japan, uh, to present uh, his talk on uh, climate change and heavy species. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'd like to start my presentation. Yes, please. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, I thank you, organizer, to provide me a chance to present my talk. I'm uh, Minami from uh, Rikan Institute, Japan. As a background of our research, we are now facing global warming. Uh, the effect of global warming and climate change has brought worldwide concern about a decrease of crop yield uh, for staple and grains and biomass resources like uh, heavy abrasions. Uh, development of plants will improve at uh, characteristic will uh, contribute to vital global issues such as securing a stable, steady supply for food resource and climate change. Japan is also affecting uh, by global warming. We have very hot summer and reduced uh, snow uh, in winter. This scheme uh, represents the prediction when we do not have any actions for global warming. To reduce uh, greenhouse gases, many countries now trying to shift 
their lifestyle from uh, petroleum uh, dependent man material production to more uh, sustainable uh, environmental, uh, environmental friendly production by natural resources. Uh, dry summer uh, in the country affects crop production, and also we have uh, guerrilla uh, rainfall with thunderstorms and cause uh, water overflow uh, from river. For crops, uh, we are trying to obtain data from current uh, farmland and also uh, and make a prediction using climate data. We are trying to represent climate change in experimental conditions uh, to collect data such as uh, grain yield. So we, are, uh, we have uh, equipment uh, to monitor plant uh, behavior, uh, plant development, and also we have uh, several uh, center to check uh, the plant growth under uh, different temperature, humidity, and the uh, right conditions. So uh, prediction, we are now using a D4 PDF database. This database contains uh, climate information of past 61 years. You can compare uh, calculated three scenarios. One is uh, without any uh, uh, global warming. Uh, second is a two degree increase uh, temperature. Third is a four degree temperature increase. For this data, we can uh, make scenario not only in, in Japan and also uh, other areas. For climate simulations, uh, we are using a uh, simulator and also uh, now supercomputer, Fugaku, will also be used, uh, established in our uh, institute. So uh, for uh, climate change, there is an activity called uh, geoengineering. Did we lose? Uh... Dr. Minami. I see him online. I cannot, I cannot hear him anymore. Yes, I think he dropped the connection. I don't see him any longer. Maybe we can start taking questions. Okay. Okay, so uh, waiting for uh, Professor Minami to come back. Uh, we will start the Q&A. And uh, so there are, there are a few questions. First, uh, I don't know if the presenters already looked at the, at the, the questions. Uh, for instance, there is a question for Dr. Jesse. Uh, do you think it is useful to use uh, calopogonium as a cover crop uh, regarding uh, uh, the effect on uh, retaining soil moisture? Dr. Jesse? Oh, Dr. Jesse seems to be out also. Yes, there, there is a very interesting. Uh, Question about from uh, Mr. Vinu Gobinat from uh, from Michelin SMPT uh, regarding the soil conservation. Nobody huh, nobody spoke about the silt pits or water retention pits. 
for water uh, conservation. So as, a, as anybody, an idea on that. Rick, are you then here? Hello. Yes, there is a, there is a, a question from Mr. Vinu Gabinat from SMPT uh, Michelin uh, about the, the soil pits for water conservation and uh, fertility conservation in the soil. And he says that uh, nobody has addressed the question during the presentations. So can, uh, can someone uh, answer? No. I'm very sorry. Uh, now, uh, okay. Okay, Dr. Minami is back, huh? so we will uh, let him to finish his presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I'll start. I'll uh, restart uh, from here. Uh, CCUS is a carbon capture, utilization, and storage. CCUS is now trying to use. Uh, thermal power plant to pump uh, carbon dioxide uh, to underground. And among them, uh, grow trees, as you can see here, uh, is a practical approach to such as grow disease resistant clone or high yield clone to capture more carbon dioxide. So it is est estimated about half of carbon dioxide in the air is absorbed by forest. Uh, this includes uh, such activity for better scenario for sustainable development. First, uh, we, were, uh, we observe and examine our current situation. Then we predict future, not only uh, by global condition, but also future agriculture for such uh, low fertilizer. For this prediction, uh, we can try several experiments and a combination of genotype and ex uh, environment and the selected uh, clone will be challenged in the field. This uh, G by E uh, is uh, proposed, recently proposed by several researchers. We may also apply this strategy for natural rubber. As for genotype, we can choose several clone cultivars and also heavier species. For environment, we can choose several temperature condition and also disease resistance is one of such environments. In case of uh, barley, uh, 274 uh, barley accession has been selected and after pan genome sequencing, they are analyzed with various experiments. Uh, then you can select suitable accession by GBAS analysis. In this reason, we are uh, paying uh, special attention to on heavier, uh, heavier species. Uh, currently, there are two kinds of strategy for breeding. Uh, GBAS is more uh, straightforward to obtain clone with strong traits. On the other hand, uh, genomic selection has been used and are reported by Thailand Group recently to select elite clone by uh, con a contribution of uh, small traits. Uh, there are 11 uh, members of heavier species. Uh, there are uh, those are uh, Hebrabrajiensis, Bensamiana, uh, Caprolam, uh, Winensis, and so on. So uh, among them, uh, we are interested in uh, Heber Spresian and Nichita. Uh, those photos are kindly provided by uh, Mr. Adi of MRB. Heber Spresian is tall tree with long seeds. Heber uh, Nichita is small tree with uh, round seeds. Uh, they are reported to have very uh, special feature about the latex growth area and also disease resistance. The reason why uh, those uh, these species uh, species has not been used uh, in their uh, is in their poor latex uh, characteristics. For Nichita, it is reported to grow uh, dry rock area and also resistant to uh, South American leaf blight. Uh, as uh, 
Professor uh, Osman uh, mentioned uh, previously, uh, this is a habit of Brazil, uh, the habit in Brazil. Heavier Brazilians grow widely in uh, many areas, but the heavier Spreciana grow according to the river. Heavier Nichita grow a specific area in Brazil and also uh, Colombia. We are examining uh, genom genomic differences between heavier Brazilians, heavier Nichida, and Spreciana. This time is too short to uh, explain all of them, but uh, uh, about uh, we found 80 to uh, 18 to 90 percent of uh, genome is changed in coding region for both species. These differences may uh, explain uh, contribute the differences of these species. And I think these information are basis for understanding. Uh, uh, for uh, how you can use those species for breeding. This is a summary for sustainable de uh, development and climate change. We think establishment of new crone uh, is important, both by method of GBAS and genomic selections. I agree with, I agree with the opinion. Uh, uh, by Professor Othman, uh, right crown at the right place on environment is uh, needed. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Minami. Uh, so uh, we come back to the Q&A session which could be a little bit short. I don't know from the organizers how much time we have to manage the Q&A session as we are uh, seem to be a little bit late on the program. So if we look, if we look, if we look at the, at the Q&A, uh, the last questions. So we have this uh, we have this question uh, from uh, Mr. Vinu Gobina, which is addressed to the agronomists. Uh, a general question: Why is seed pits or water collection pits not mentioned and discussed in any of the presentation? Is it because of the in initial installation cost and the need for regular maintenance? I feel this will be very effective in this situation in terms of water management. So can uh, can uh, agronomists? of this group answer to this question. Yeah, Dr. Yeah? It's uh, uh, cost intensive. For construction of pits, you have to, there's a lot of labor required. Construction of pits. And it is in the, the literature for the last century. So you were focusing on the newer techniques. So already a lot of literature is available on the silk pits, merits and demerits. So we were focusing on the new techniques and new innovations. Is it okay, sir? It's okay, understood. I hope the answer will fit Mr. Vinu. Thank you, Dr. Desi. Uh, to the Professor Sergei, there is another question. Why using time average carbon stock in this study? which parameters were considered to make the calculation and which edge was considered for natural forest? Uh, we took a natural forest edge, which uh, was known for that region. In fact, it was two types of forest in National Reserve for 70 years and another uh, was uh, 50 years because it was a secondary forest, in fact and we knew the age. But uh, really, uh, rainforest uh, primary could uh, store more carbon, clearly. And uh, we used uh, time average uh, carbon stock for rubber plantation with uh, uh, rotation lengths uh, 30 years for this model, what I showed. I showed. It's a relatively short one, but it's typical for that region. Thank you, Sergei. Okay, 
scrolling among the. Yes, so there is a, another question to Dr. Jesse, uh, which is uh, Do you think it is useful to use Calopogonium species as cover crop? Yes. As we found okay. not, not much significant difference in retaining soil mature. Yes, uh, Calopogonium also can be used as a cover crop. There are two species Calopogonium euconoids and Calopogonium ceruleum. Calopogonium ceruleum tolerates shade and come up in late maturity phase and mature phase. So for a continued conservation, the shade torn ones will be better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question direct to Dr. Jesse. Uh, your experiments are, are, are set up in Kerala. And Kerala is not yet uh, a, marginal, a marginal area, especially regarding drought, uh, even if, uh, say, the length of dry season may increase. Uh, what do you think about the agroforestry system, possible competitions for water uptake in the dry conditions like you have in the center of India? Uh, in fact, sir, I, the agroforestry system should be location specific. Only mm -hmm. difference you are making is the selection of crops that is prone to be in association with rubber. So what we have seen that in most of the agroforestry system, there is a complementary association between rubber and intercrops. And even marginal lands, it will be more uh, useful because drought is a cons major constraint in these marginal lands. So once you can establish this agroforestry system, there will be a conservation of soil moisture in the marginal lands also. So it will be more useful. Only thing is, when you are going for the agroforestry system per se, you have to choose the crop according to the local agroclimatic region and local suitability. So this nutrient okay. dynamics and the other effects are common in all the places, okay. irrespective of this uh, location. Okay, just I, I just made this remark because we had observed some uh, adverse effects in the very very severe drought conditions when the said the, the advantages of the cover crop huh, became uh, became to be adverse. For what water is that sorry, in our experiments or our case studies, what we, we have seen is that any undergrowth on the soil is beneficial for uh, reducing the drought intensity and also for okay. improving soil fertility. So we have to avoid land being barren without any undergrowth in our plantation. Again, one thing, uh, one we have one question we have to address is the trade off between natural flora and uh, cover crops because natural flora is a diverse system with diverse flora with the multi stratal root growth, diverse litter, litter quality, etc. And cover crop is a single vegetation, there is no diversity. So, what we will have to address is the trade off between these two natural flora and uh, cover crop. So we need more studies, more uh, in-depth deliberations on this. So earlier, rubber plantations were always concentrating on establishing uh, leguminous cover crops and cover, crop, cover plantation for maintaining soil health. But the results recently coming out are uh, uh, showing that natural flora is equally good. And there is no cost involved also. Only thing is you have to maintain or manage the natural vegetation. So we need more studies and more deliberations in this aspect. Okay, Dr. Jesse, thank you very much. And, uh, you can uh, continue to, to look at the questions and direct, uh, directly answer to the, to the questions in the, in the chat box. Uh, there is a question to Dr. Fatima. Uh, which is uh, what about say the the use uh, the usage of this uh, new huh, uh, new epoxidized rubber huh? why is not why do you use as if, if it looks so good oh, sorry why is it what there, there was there was a question and uh, there was a question uh, regarding uh, say the usage uh, the use in practice huh, of the new epoxidized formulations of natural rubber? 
And there was one question. We say you show many advantages of this product compared to any synthetic rubber. So the question is why is not more used than it is? Oh, okay. Uh, in, on that aspect, in my opinion, because this is actually, I know the, the technology of producing the Cicopina Ipropina is already way back in 1980s. However, because uh, most of the rubber product manufacturer is already, uh, is already comfortable with the material they are using now. So to change to a new material, it, it requires R&D from, from their parts also. So uh, we need to tackle this slowly with them. We need to work closely with them. So <clears throat> via this approach, it can actually uh, provide um, better advantage uh, in using, in actually increasing the usage of this material. Okay. So you have to advertise. Yes, we need to promote market, do marketing and all that. Because that's why, that's why it is important from our part to actually do uh, products, commercial products, and show to people that this can be used using existing product uh, processing line without any changing in the processing, processing setup. That is already what uh, being presented just now. It's all on a commercial production line being used to produce all the products. Okay, so I think uh, we are going to close the Q&A session there and to go to the uh, Excuse me, Eric. Break. Yes. Eric, Please? I have two yes. quick questions before you close. One okay. is to Professor Sergey, you know, uh, he has done this work in China. Uh, my question is, that experiment or the study was for how long? And did he also look into the impact of the wintering, you know, rubber trees, winter? the contribution of that leaves over that period that he did the study. Thank you. Thank you for a very uh, interesting question. Uh, uh, this, our project was five year, but in fact, in this uh, National Reserve, uh, experiments are longer. And we left uh, the plots for our co Chinese colleagues from ICRA for longer time. And uh, uh, concerning the second part, yes, uh, wintering effect in the soil quality. And I think uh, the colleagues from Shishan Bana Tropical Garden, Chinese colleagues publish on that. And maybe I can look for the references and send you. And uh, of course, uh, this wintering uh, should be considered and it uh, helps uh, to soil fertility. But it's also very challenging for modeling. And now we are really working to get it exactly this uh, little fall and new leaves in time. This uh, changing from year to year, depending on the conditions. You know, your work is very interesting. And we hope to have a collaboration with the International Rubber Research Development Board. You know, we have got many members, uh, research institutes. They can collaborate with you to, you know, to carry on further on the studies. I'm happy to discuss. That's very yeah. good, yeah. Okay, the other question uh, I have, uh, Eric, uh, for is for Professor Minami. Uh, he has a look at the genes of the three different uh, avian species. Uh, we are now trying to speed up this uh, breeding program with the cooperation of the molecular biologists. So looking at these three uh, species that he examined, uh, any possibility of incorporating some of the genes which can benefit the breeding program, either in terms of latex qualities or whatever it is that he has uh, examined. Thank you. My answer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, fortunately, I think heavier Brazilian is the uh, best one among uh, uh, all heavier species. So it is why uh, it was uh, selected and uh, it has been spread so uh, widely. But another one is uh, each uh, characteristics, like uh, Professor uh, also mentioned, some uh, grow in uh, like a very dry area or the uh, very watery area. So I think uh, by crossing with those species with heavier, uh, you can uh, apply such kind of, only such kind of characteristics to heavier Brazilians. It is one of the way. And I, I also think, uh, as you collected uh, many uh, 
heavy emergence is grown uh, in 1981 and 1955 uh, from uh, many places from Brazil and also some other place. So if you correctly know the locations where you collect it, uh, we can uh, address uh, which uh, like a climate uh, uh, they grow uh, and uh, which uh, climate uh, they prefer to grow. So uh, if you choose uh, such clone uh, uh, for breeding uh, program, maybe you have a good chance to uh, adapt, uh, uh, apply such kind of good quality to uh, current uh, clones. Study, uh, Professor Minami, uh, it has got a bearing on what we are trying to do now because we know the rubber tree, it is very unique. You know, you, a tree produced in Indonesia might perform differently in another country. So the, the study of the genes will, I think, be able to contribute. That's why we have uh, initiated this international clone exchange program, mm. which will involve 49 clones. So to be planted in the different areas, then we can monitor the performance, just as what you mentioned happens in Brazil. So thank you very much, Eric. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we are a little bit late on the program. Huh? So I propose that we close the first part of this session to now. And uh, we thank a lot, say the five presenters, I say and uh, stop the session for a very, very short break. Huh? So I give the, I give the, the, the floor again to the organizers and we come back soon for the last two papers of this day. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, we will stop for a short break until quarter past, uh, what time is it in Singapore? Past six or past five? Oh. Anyway, anyway, for, for six minutes. Uh, and we will start again with the presentation of Dr. Omo Cafe, who in the oh, meantime okay. managed to connect. And so we'll have three presentations. So I hope all presenters will be able to really stick to their time so that we still have time for question and answer at the end. Okay, very thank good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> so in five minutes, everybody back. <laughs> and maybe in the meantime, we, we can check if everything, the, the connection with Dr. Omo Cafe, if, you're, if everything's okay. Can we hear you? Please, Dr. Omokafe, if you can speak yes. up. Yes. Thank, you, Thank so you so much. I hope to make my presentation when you resume the second session. Okay. 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 There, there's some background noise. Um, okay. 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 The other, the other Zoom phone. Yes, it seems there's a second device connected because there is really background noise, like feedback. And you can maybe mute the second device. Okay. I think it's better now. Yeah, okay. Are, uh, do you need assistance from us to share your presentation or will you, or do you want to manage it yourself? Maybe I we hope can, I can manage it by myself. Maybe we can yes. test the, the chair screen. Yep. Okay, let's Please. let's test. Let's let's test. test. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Good coffee. Yes, sir. <laughs> you can hear me very clearly? Yes, please. We are very I'm happy to see you, you know? Well, um, it's a pleasure being with you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what is the time in Nigeria now? It's uh, 11 uh, minutes uh, after six? 10. 10, 11 a.m. 11 a.m.? 10 a.m. 
Oh, 10 a.m. Okay. Yes. That's why yes, you look, yes, you look yes. very fresh. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> we are, thank you so we much. are at the end of the day already. You know, we have to wait another yes. hour and a half. Uh. So, oh, sorry, oh. sorry to interrupt you, but Two. let's try to get this screen functionality on. Uh, okay, we okay. only have three more minutes. So you have a green. Yeah, yeah, there's a green Go button ahead. at the bottom on, on the bottom of the screen. You will see it says share screen, and once you click okay. that, it gives you a, a number of options. But you can just pick the first option, which is share your screen, and that will share, share everything that is on your. Okay, so, it's starting. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, it's perfect. So then so, you just okay. run the presentation in full mode, uh, just like a normal presentation, and we will be able yeah, to follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Uh, perfect. So for yeah. me, I propose to fine. stay like that. You know? Okay, we can stay like this, and in two minutes we start again, and we will just start you, with your yeah. your screen. Don't change anything, Doctor McCaffrey. No, 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 leave no. it like this. Okay, Thank we you, will have, let you start in two minutes time. Thanks. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, you want to hear? Oh, you want to hear? Hear my presentation. If you go now, you'll be on the road. Can I make my presentation? What? All right. We need, we need a green light from Fabio and Alexander. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, I think we're in time. Just okay. go ahead. Yes. So please, okay. uh, thank you for coming back uh, after this break. Very short. <laughs> uh, oh. We will start. Uh, we will start this. Uh, second session by coming back on session one in fact huh? uh, as we have uh, solved the connection problems of dr homo cafe from uh, rebel research institute of nigeria and is going to make his presentation on rebel trees and climate change is dr homo cafe floor is yours thank you very much for the second chance given to me today my profound apology for the failed uh, earlier session the title is Place of the Rubber Tree Hidea by Residences in Climate Change. Uh, climate change refers to changing weather factors over a period of 30 years without the likelihood of return to the former threshold of weather factors. Hence, it is called climate change because the chance to return to the former threshold is almost impossible. Uh, natural factors, some of them have been mentioned by previous presenters. Factors who are affected by climate change, temperature, rainfall, relative humidity, vegetation, biodiversity, very, very important. The earth is experiencing a lot of loss of biodiversity because of climate change. And for man, there is a 
loss of means of livelihood. There is migration with attendant uh, socioeconomic challenges, lowered resistance to pests, antibodies, and diseases. Some of these were reflected in presentations uh, yesterday, and natural hazards such as drought, flooding, etc. On the course of uh, evolution, both organic and inorganic evolution, trees have played a significant role to stabilize climate change. It has been reported that on the geologic time scale, trees reduced concentration of carbon dioxide from 650 ppm to 100 ppm. I also believe very strongly that the pre-industrial carbon level of 280 ppm was stabilized by trees. However, that level is being threatened since the industrial age, we have witnessed increase in carbon concentration of the atmosphere. Here's the objective of this paper, to highlight the place of rubber tree in climate change adaptation and mitigation. In the course of the incidence of climate change since the 18th century, there were some controversies. Some said, no, there is no climate change. Some said, yes, there is climate change. And over time, the reality of climate change has given credence to those who believe that there is climate change. And there is worldwide acceptance of climate change, evident so much in increase in temperature. <clears throat> However, having accepted the incidence of climate change, there was the dominance of engineering techniques five years, 10 years ago, it's only engineering techniques that we will hear of. It was difficult to accept the place of biological organisms or bioorganisms in the place of uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. One will not be surprised because there was the incidence of ozone depletion before acceptance of climate change and engineering techniques were effectively applied to check ozone depletion. Hence, the initial response through engineering techniques. However, there has been the effort to, pro to, pro to project the place of trees in, the, uh, in managing climate change. Initially, it was difficult because of the dominance of engineering team, the dominance of engineering knowledge in handling climate change. And so, several authors working in several continents of the world had to make efforts to push for the place of trees. We have Brescias and his team in America, both North and South America, Omoha Fair and his team in West Africa, and several other authors. And we thank God that today, there is worldwide acceptance of the application of tree culture in checking climate change. <clears throat> However, after the acceptance of trees in handling climate change, there was another problem accepting the place of the rubber tree in addressing the issues of climate change. Many of the critics of the use of rubber tree say that rubber tree leads to deforestation. Be that as it may, it is not wrong, it is very correct, but there are critical areas that rubber tree can be applied. For instance, there is loss of forests as a result of climate change. And how can these forests be restored? It is through cultivation of trees, and rubber can come in for restoration of forests. We also know that many forest dwellers are low-income earners, people living below the standard poverty index, Enhancing their productivity in the face of forest degradation is very important. And rubber is an economic tree that can also come in to fill that gap. In this regard, the rubber tree is an outstanding tree crop to meet these multiple requirements of climate change agriculture. So what are the possible options? Tree farming. A mosaic of trees can be planted. I think this one was mentioned in one of the papers we had this morning. Mosaic of trees. And we have a successful story of mosaic of trees involving rubber in Cote d'Ivoire, which is referenced here. We also have a successful uh, case of 
three mosaic farming in Brazil, which is referenced here. Where rubber is a significant component of the tree mosaic. For forest restoration, there are forests that are undergoing degradation. They have not been fully degraded. Rubber could form a successful part of restoration of such forests. I do recall, I think sometime in 2013, in uh, Brazil, our friend Nassaro Jean gave a report on reseeding of some plantations, some natural plantations with rubber tree played a significant role. That's a good example of forest restoration, and so it's an option that can be explored to the advantage of rubber tree. There is afforestation. Um, they will have the humid savanna as well as the dry savanna. Savanna is uh, the grassland in West Africa is referred to as savanna. Grassland in several countries, several cont continents assume different names. Notwithstanding, grassland can be arid or humid. The humid savanna normally has a good array of trees, but with climate change, tree population in humid savanna is being depleted. Therefore, afforestation of humid savanna is necessary, and rubber tree is a suitable crop in this regard. In Nigeria, we have trials of rubber tree in Guinea savanna, which is the humid savanna in Nigeria, and rubber tree has been successfully cultivated. We do hope that at the next opportunity, we will have data to provide and to support afforestation of humid savanna so that we can increase the population of trees in the humid savanna. The application of rubber tree in non-traditional areas It looks like we have lost uh, Dr. Omokafe over time. Connection issue, yes. I think we can move ahead and see if we can manage to get him back later. 